Welcome to the Wednesday podcast. Today, you're going to hear from students at Fuller Seminary who have been asked to reflect on racial discrimination and cultural bias. Having conversations about our experiences with discrimination allows us to grow in our walk with God. We understand that this topic is one that some may wish to avoid, but we are confident that listening to other stories brings us closer together as we connect on a deeper level with one another. Thank you for listening. Separated by color, united in love, this is Greg Meek. Love and hate are two horns on the same goat. Now, this quote was from the maid Minnie Jackson, the fictional character in Catherine Stockett's book, The Help, and it encapsulates the dichotomy of life in 1960s Mississippi. What now and should seem so foreign to everyone comes flooding back from the memory bank of my mind every time the word race is spoken. Memories of love, hatred, and confusion are married together as they surface from a bygone era of segregation in the South. Now, as a young child growing up in small town Mississippi in the 60s and 70s, my ever so perfect existence can be contrasted by journeying to the other side of town in what was called the black section. And in a town of 3,000, you didn't have far to go, yet the vast divide between black and white was so expansive as the ocean was from America to Africa. My world was wrapped up in the help. It was a term that all black maids were given by our white mothers. I grew up on the edge of the Mississippi Delta, a land that was stained with the blood of slaves that 100 years earlier found freedom from servitude at the conclusion of the Civil War. And although they had found freedom, the people of two colors existed in a shared land, but in a massive cultural divide. The only time that the colors mixed was passing on the street or in the employment of a white family. The only economic opportunities for black people in this era was either maid or teacher in a black school for the women and a yard boy or field worker for the men. Now as a middle class white family, everyone I knew had help. Most white mothers were housewives and their days were filled with luncheons and bridge. And my mom was a little different in that she had gone to college and had the position of an officer in the local bank. So it was no surprise that I was left during the day to be raised by our help. And her name was Corrine. She had been born in our town and left for New Orleans to live with an aunt at a young age to seek a different life than could be found in our community. And after several years of working in a bakery, she returned in her late 20s, a single mom desperate to find work. But by this time, she was hired by my mother because that was the only job she could find. And she began the task of raising this little white boy while her daughter was left at home with her grandmother. We developed an instant bond, like most white children did with their help. She would arrive at breakfast, spend the morning cleaning the house, cooking the meals, and leave at the end of the day by 5.30 to go back across town to her daughter to sleep and return in the morning to do all over again. Meals were served by her to my family, and after we were finished, she was allowed to eat at the table by herself. Now, as I grew older in my teens, I began to question why Corrine could not eat with us at the table. And it was always dismissed as they have their world, we have ours, and that's how it's done. Many times she was in the other room and could hear the questions and responses, and she would always take me aside and say, don't worry, honey, one day we're going to all be together with Jesus and everything will be made right. She always quoted Revelation 7, 9, which says, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We're all together there. Corrine passed away several years ago, 
And as segregation ended in the South and the years changed so many circumstances, Corrine chose to stay with my family. That's because she was part of our family, no matter the differences in color. She and my mother became dear friends, and we mourned her sweet soul when she passed. Things are still not right between God's creation, white people and people of color. But just like our relationship through Jesus, one day there will be no divide and everything's going to be all right. Doing Justice, this is Suzanne Clune. Today I want to tell you a story about several of my 8th grade grandparents, specifically how they decided to do justice when confronted with deep injustice. They came to this country in 1683, to the colony of Pennsylvania. They were Quakers who had converted from Lutheranism in Germany and had been persecuted there for their beliefs. Their community was called Germantown, and it is now part of Philadelphia. Decades after their arrival, Quakers would be known as fierce abolitionists. But in the 1680s, not all Quakers were anti-slavery. Even William Penn, who allowed them to purchase their land and was the person who converted them to Quakerism when they still lived in Germany, owned enslaved people. Five years after their arrival, my German Quaker ancestors did something unusual. They protested slavery. Several of this original group got together and wrote up a protest in their meeting house. They petitioned their parent church to ban the practice. They asked fellow Quakers if they would consent to be treated in the way that enslaved Africans were being treated. They noted that, quote, it is a terror or a fearful thing that men should be handled so in Pennsylvania. Learning about this protest was a revelation for me. They were not yet a powerful group. They were still learning to speak English. They were connected in community to those who owned enslaved people. They took a risk. They were willing to challenge even those in power above them, even those who were their friends. More than 300 years later, I hear in their actions the words of Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. They looked at their world and considered what God required of them. What did doing justice look like in their context? How should they love kindness and walk humbly with their God? Their protest was their answer. As a Christian who is a white woman in America today, I am asking, what does God require of me? Am I willing to have hard conversations and even risk losing relationships? I am still learning from my forebearers. I have wondered what my response would be had I been living at that time. I can only hope that I would do as they had done. But it is so easy to think about past events and hope that we would act in the way that others had. I would love to say that their parent meeting houses listened to them and prohibited Quakers from owning other people at that time. That was not the case. Ultimately, the Quaker meeting houses in America wouldn't prohibit their members from owning enslaved people for another 90 years. This document, known as the Germantown Protest of 1688, would be lost for 150 years, resurfacing in the 1840s to support the anti-slavery movement. I do not share this story as one we can feel good about and then quickly forget. I have learned so much from these distant grandparents. They spoke out when faced with deep injustice. 300 years later, the structure of injustice has changed. The need to address that injustice has not. I think a lot about Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. I am learning that doing justice is about emulating the Samaritan and seeing the hurt of my neighbor. It's not about upholding traditions and patterns that support some and hurt others. Doing justice means cutting at the heart of the privilege I carry in the color of my skin. What does God require of me? What does he require of you? Do I have eyes to see the injustices before me? Do I have eyes to see the people who are receiving that injustice? How should I do justice? How will you do justice?
Who's American Dream? This is Ryan Cavender. My grandmother was born in the province of Matsuyama, Japan in 1927, when she was given the name Hisako Akiyama. Today, at the young age of 94, she resides in Southern California and answers to the name Michi Cavender. One quick glance at her life and you would assume that she achieved the American dream. She married a young Marine, left her war-torn country, and built a comfortable life here in the United States. But the painful truth is that my grandmother never dreamt that dream. It was never a goal of hers to make it to the United States, and even after she arrived, there were times where it felt less like a dream, more like a nightmare. Don't get me wrong, she loved my grandfather dearly, but following him back to the United States was no small sacrifice. She left behind her family and her culture, forfeiting her own identity only to be treated with contempt by Americans who had yet to deal with the deep-seated prejudices developed during the war. And so, with memories of the air raids that decimated her village still fresh in her mind, my grandmother first stepped onto American soil in the spring of 1950. It wouldn't take long for her or my grandfather to see that many in the South still harbored hatred towards her and towards her people. So a quick decision was made by my grandfather to assimilate her to American culture as quickly as possible. Her name was quickly changed from Hisako Akiyama to Michi Cavender, and she immediately began dressing like an American, cooking like an American, and she even tried her hardest to speak like an American with no Japanese accent. These changes were more than just surface level, though, as she was also expected to think, feel, and act like an American housewife. All of these changes might make it seem like my grandfather was a terrible person, but I can assure you that he cared deeply for my grandmother. Her forced assimilation was a result of a racist culture combined with my grandfather's ignorance. Unfortunately, that dangerous combination stripped her of any remaining pieces of her Japanese identity, while doing very little to protect her from racist remarks and improper treatment. The ripple effect of her forced assimilation is still felt today as her only son, my father, knows very little about his own heritage. He was never taught to speak Japanese, never visited his mother's homeland, and he's honestly not even very good at using chopsticks. He was never even given a chance to embrace his own heritage. But by the grace of God, my grandmother became a Christian in the early 90s. And the Lord revealed to her that her true identity isn't found in her country of origin, but in her relationship with Jesus. As Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what this simple but profound truth did is it enabled her to embrace her Japanese identity once again, understanding that it is an important part of who she is, but that it does not define who she is. She's not free from the derogatory remarks or the prejudices Asian Americans face today, but she now faces them with courage rather than shame, as she's surrounded by a community of people just like her, each firmly planted in the truth of their identity in Christ. I am so grateful for my grandmother's resiliency and grateful to God for blessing her with a long life, one that has resulted in 11 great-grandchildren, each of which can confidently express their love for her in her native tongue. This is Julie. The segment is titled, Under Our Own Roof. Much has been made about racism and generational curses. Is it a curse because God willed it? Or is it a curse in that what we experience passes from one generation to the next because it's what we know to be normal? We often think of racism as pitting one people against another. But what happens when it's directed within one's own family, from those who were meant to love and protect us? In absence of safe spaces, the victimized are likely to become ones who prey on those more vulnerable. Paraphrased, Exodus 34 speaks to generational curses. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. 
he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. The racism and cultural violence that I grew up with began when my father's family immigrated from Czech in the early 1900s. His great grandmother, their matriarch, was the first to immigrate and then financed her daughter and son-in-law's passage. Because of her, they were able to purchase a large farm and attain financial success and stability. She was a devout Jewish woman, yet despite her generosity, her son-in-law treated her with disdain, referring to her as that dirty Jew. He didn't seem to recognize that his wife and children were also Jewish. He wanted to remove any Jewish association with his family and required that his wife convert and their children be raised Catholic. Given the time period, I wonder if this was a marriage sought for its benefits rather than love, given his overt anti-Semitism. As a result, my grandmother, one of their 13 children, grew up straddling two worlds, being religiously Catholic and secretly racially Jewish. My grandmother spent a great deal of time with her Jewish grandmother. From her, she learned kosher traditions, which became meaningful as she grew from a girl to a woman to a wife with her own Catholic family. The generational curse of bigotry continued as my grandmother married a Czech man within their immigrant community. George was an alcoholic and an anti-Semite, taunting his own son, my father, calling him Jew boy. Because of George's cruelty, dad would wrestle with being two people, one a very good man, the other unhealed and raging. Persecution of the innocent is not new, and one can feel Habakkuk's anguish as he cries out, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, Violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Transitioning to my mother's story, Mum was born in America, but raised in Mexico, learning English at 18, marrying my father at 19. She had a difficult time finding community being too white for Mexicans, but too Mexican for the whites. And after a lifetime of absorbing my grandfather's poison, dad directed his anger against her for being Mexican. When my dad was angry, he would threaten mom with deportation, calling her racial slurs. And for too many years, our home rang with ugly words. However, our story doesn't end there. Against all expectations, God delivered us. And over time, with great intentionality and love, Dad became just the good man. The other man fell away as if it were never there. God, in his love, broke the curse of bigotry and violence that held our family for generations. The Lord is indeed good. Hi, I'm Carlotta, and today I want to invite you into a story of someone who had privilege and used that to stand up for the oppressed. It's a story that you've heard many times, but today let's look at it with fresh eyes. It's the story of Moses. Exodus 2, 11 through 12. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses was part of the dominant class. He was not subject to oppression, and he stood against injustice. He understood that even though he was raised by Pharaoh, he was still Hebrew. Moses' violent action was wrong, and it took away his ability to advocate for the Hebrews. However, his heart to stand for the oppressed, even against his own cultural norm, is what we're called to do. Today, we are not Hebrews and Egyptians. We are a body of Christians who all look different. We are called to be one people no longer divided by race. Jeremiah 22.3 says, Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. The white community of Christians may do no wrong by not participating in racist behavior, but God is calling us to go beyond that. We are to rescue those from the oppressor. So what does that look like? Well, like Moses, if we see something questionable going on, we should use our influence and privilege to check in and make sure things are okay. 
we can be the voice for those who are marginalized in our communities. For example, I was heading to Walmart right after the killing of George Floyd, when tensions were really high between the black community and the police. There were two people standing outside, both were African American, one male and one female. The female was standing to the side and I asked if everything was okay and if she needed help. She indicated everything was fine. Now, I have family members that are police and I trust the police, but that does not mean that every single police officer is fair and just. I had the opportunity to ask without interfering, so I did. It's not hard to ask if everything is okay, to check in on nonviolent, questionable situations. Should there have been an issue with that couple, I could have stood by the side of them, out of the way, and been a witness. We can be present and aware of our surroundings and check in on people if we think something is amiss. We must be willing to challenge the people and institutional practices that are inequitable. If we see inequity and we have privilege, we can use our position to work for the oppressed. We are one people. For those of us with privilege, it is no longer enough for us to be individually non-racist. We need to take action to ensure the fair treatment we receive is received by all. Hi, I'm Donick. In this segment, I will share with you how people who experienced injustice because of their ethnicity heal through forgiveness. The civil war in Ethiopia was long in the making before it broke into a full-fledged war. It stems from how various ethnic groups consider their ethnicity superior to others. Historically, the power of government has been in the hands of few of these ethnic groups, and the ethnic hatred tends to be more intense between these few groups. When the civil war broke in November 2020, the Tigrayan people became targets because of their ethnic ties to the Tigray Liberation Front. The Tigrayan people are only 5 million and live in the northern part of Ethiopia, but there are some who are professionals or who own businesses who live in other cities. Let me share with you about a woman named Haddas who found herself entangled in this mess. She was born in Addis Ababa from Tigrayan parents. Her Ethiopian identity was stronger than her ethnic identity, but when the war broke, things changed. Government-sponsored media as well as social media started profiling the Tigrayan people as enemies. She started to sense the hatred when her close neighbor, who has been her support base, began to distance herself. Her neighbor told her that she is emotionally disturbed when she sees her. Then came the police demanding to search her home slashed mattresses as they did. Then came the threat on the family business. The government started to ask for unreasonable amount of money in tax without looking at the books. She then heard that her brother was taken by the police. Nobody knows where he is. Hadas heard that people who have been jealous of their success are making allegations and that it is a matter of time before the police came after them. Hadas and her family left their beloved life in Addis Ababa and by God's grace managed to enter the United States. Hadas knew that they were among the lucky few that made it to a country like the USA. There are thousands of refugees in Sudan with little access to necessities. But as she and her family struggle to adjust to a new life in the USA, she often struggles with bitterness and hate towards those who caused this to happen. She cries out to God for justice. She wants everyone who has been complicit in this to pay, including her neighbor. Hadas and her family decided to go to an English-speaking church away from the ethnic drama of the Ethiopian church. Hadas feels safe in this non-Ethiopian community who can pray sincerely according to God's heart. Her heart began to soften as she stands shoulder to shoulder with complete strangers singing in unison. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. The truth confronts her that Jesus suffered for the sins of those horrible people that caused so much hurt on her and many like her. But it is not just their sins, it's also her sins. As much as she wants justice, she also wants mercy. 
She wants it not just for herself, but also for those who caused her harm. It was a decision that she made against her strong feelings. It was a choice to forgive, but it was only possible because she remembered that Jesus forgave her first. It should not be this way. Hi, my name is Mindy Krejci, and I'm going to share about a woman whom I've never met, but who has deeply influenced my life. Miss Wanda Cooper Jones and I both live in Georgia. We are both mothers of sons whom we love fiercely. Miss Cooper Jones is black and I am white. I am able to hug both of my sons every day, but Miss Cooper Jones can no longer do so. Her youngest son, Ahmaud Arbery, was murdered by three white men in Brunswick, Georgia, on February 23, 2020. Ahmaud, a 25-year-old black man, was out jogging one afternoon. Three men got in a truck with a shotgun, chased Ahmaud down, and cornered him. One of the men shot Ahmaud when he tried to fight for his life. On that day, Miss Cooper Jones became yet another black mother to no unspeakable anguish. It's the anguish of having one's child taken by racially motivated violence at the hands of a white person. She said in an interview that she, quote, joined a sorority of black mothers whose children had been killed because of their race. Ms. Cooper Jones then had to bury her son and grieve while his murderers walked free. Although the three men were on the scene when the police arrived and found Ahmaud dead from gunshots, the DA recommended that no charges be brought against them. Georgia's antiquated citizen's arrest law was birthed in the days of slavery. It sheltered the three men under the power of white privilege. The state of Georgia failed Ms. Cooper Jones. It failed Ahmaud Arbery. It wasn't until cell phone video footage of the murder was made public that the three men were finally arrested on May 7, 2020, more than two months after Ms. Cooper Jones lost her son. Their arrests came the day before Ahmaud's 26th birthday. I prayed for Ms. Cooper Jones that day, hoping she would find some solace from their arrests amidst the pain of living through Ahmaud's birthday without him. Because I am white, I do not have to teach my boys how to survive being pulled over by a police officer. I do not have to remind them that there are people who think they don't matter because of their skin color. I cannot understand the experience of being a black mom raising a black son in America. I am not forced to endure the daily mental stress of fearing for my son's life. Ms. Cooper Jones' profound loss is something I will never be able to comprehend. However, I do know that it should not be this way. Every single person is created in the image of God. Our worth comes from him, not our skin color. I do not know how to end the injustice of racism, but I can cry out to God and lament on the behalf of Ms. Cooper Jones and black mothers who fear for their children. Were you there when they chased down and shot Ahmad? Because it seems that if you had been there, Lord, Ms. Cooper Jones' son wouldn't have died. How many, O oh Lord, how many? How many more black mothers must bury their sons and mourn their daughters? How long, O oh Lord, how long? How long will they have to weep for their children and every day have sorrow in their hearts? Has your river of justice stopped rolling for all time? Has your stream of righteousness pooled into broken, whitewashed cisterns? Why do you allow hate to dwell alongside your spirit in the hearts of so many white people who claim to follow Jesus? How shamefully we have treated those whom your own hands have formed and made. Awaken us to the state of our desperately wicked hearts. If my son had been violently taken from me, I think I would conclude that your unfailing love had vanished for all time. But Ms. Cooper Jones didn't. After hearing the guilty verdict read in the trial of Maud's murderers, she proclaimed, It's been a long fight. It's been a hard fight, but God is good. If she who unjustly suffered so much didn't waver through unbelief regarding the goodness of God, what right do I have to question your goodness? Lord, comfort those who mourn. Encourage those who endure injustice. Convict those who are fueled by their hate. 
overcome evil with your goodness. My name is Gaia Zhen, and I will be talking about my race against the big lies. Sometimes I wonder if it will be me. Will I be the next black person to suffer injustice? I can sometimes hear the varied news channels talk about me. Another one. Will people be outraged? Will they recognize the great error that cost me my life? A young woman who is getting her master's in theology works in two nonprofits whose ultimate goal is to make the world a better place by being a decent human. A good citizen in a world filled with tyranny, systemic racism, and brokenness. Another one. Another one. Gone. Will things change for the better then? Or will my life be another casualty in this seemingly endless warfare that is more spiritual than people realize? My mind then just to the many times my mother warned my brother and I about racism. She would say things like, be careful of who you keep company with, because if anything bad were to happen, you would be the one in trouble because you are black and people in this country don't like us because of the color of his skin. The very fact that my skin's pigmentation was different to the majority made it feel like there was an endless barrier that divided me from belonging. My thoughts then shift to the first time I was called the N-word. I was in fourth grade. I remember feeling shocked. Back then, I was bullied often because I was so different. Aside from the color of my skin, I lived in the projects, spoke a different language, and ate different food. The list goes on. I was very surprised that the young boy used a derogatory word, knowing the negative connotation. I was surprised that our classmates laughed. I was surprised that other kids thought it was okay because no one said anything. I am then reminded of an instance when my eighth grade teacher nonchalantly called me the N-word in class. I remember my automatic response was to say, what? Because I didn't want to believe what I heard and was bewildered as to why my teacher would use the word unprovoked or even at all. However, from the expression of shock and unfortunately amusement from my classmate, I knew that I heard correctly. Alas, there have been many more incidents. After each incident, I'm always stunned, silent. I then resurfaced my reality, and I am reminded that I have a hope and a power that is greater than life itself. A hope which affirms my identity, gives birth to new mental models, and creates the ultimate desire of any human, a sense of belonging. Paul says to Philemon in Philemon 1.16 that because Onanimus is a follower of Christ, he is not only part of Christ's sonship, but also Philemon's brother in Christ. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I am his beloved daughter. And even those who have believed in the big lies of racism are my brothers and sisters. Because we are part of the same sonship of Christ, I choose to love them. Thank you for joining us. We pray that these stories will prompt reflection, awareness, and action, and begin to tear down the walls that separate us. Our next podcast will be called The Rigged Game, where we will be addressing economic implications of racial disparity in the American economic system. We look forward to seeing you again.